Yes, Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead, and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body, they saw the angel sitting there, and they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than almost any other fact in Roman history. I don't believe there's a fact in ancient history today so well proven as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even if there was no proof, no historical proof, no scientific proof, and there is, I would still believe it because I believe this book is God's inspired word and the whole early church went up and down the country preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the thing that shook the Roman Empire, that a man had risen from the dead, that he was alive, that death could not hold him. Christ is alive. He's a living Savior. Amen. The essentials of the gospel. The essentials of the gospel. Who, why, and how. You know, there was a man who only came to church on Easter Sunday. He had come to the same church for 30 years on Easter Sunday. Sunday, but he never came on any other Sunday. He'd been the same pastor for 30 years. And then after the 30th year, on the 31st year, he didn't come. His name was Joe. They lived in a small town, so he would see Joe every once in a while. And the pastor wondered, what happened to Joe? And so he saw him a few weeks later at a restaurant, and he said, Joe, we missed you this past Easter. What happened? He said, well, I want to be honest with you, pastor. He said, you know, I've been coming every year on Easter for 30 years, but honestly, it seems like it's always the same subject. It's always the gospel and the resurrection. And he was right. And I unashamedly want to tell you right now that we are preaching the gospel and the power of the resurrection. It's what our whole entire faith hinges on. If there is no Jesus, if there is no resurrection, then we are wasting our time and we shouldn't even be here. But the gospel is what our faith faith rest on. Matter of fact, today we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to see a couple of scriptures that are the oldest recorded scriptures that we know of in the New Testament. Matter of fact, this creed is what it, is actually what it's called. Uh, you know, we do what some might call the Apostles' Creed. We actually do the old Romans' Creed, which is even older than the Apostles' Creed uh, during the Christmas and Easter season. And right in the heart of it, you see this creed. This was being recited with within just months, uh, at the most, a couple of years after Christ died. Dr. Gary Habermas, who is a noted theologian and scholar, says that he has evidence to show that this creed was being recited within six months after the death of Christ. Even Gerhard Luderman, who is an atheist, says that it certainly was being transmitted within five years. Why is that important? Because sometimes you'll hear people say, well, you know how the, 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 the gospel in Christianity has kind of evolved and it's just changed and it's, it's not really what it was before. No, we have evidence here to show this is exactly what was being preached, even within a year after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So if you have your Bibles, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we will see the who, the essentials of the gospel. These aren't teachings. These aren't matters of taste. These are essentials. If you don't believe this, it's not Christianity, and you need to make sure that you've embraced the essentials of the gospel who, Jesus, why, because of our sin, and how, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Paul, speaking here in 1 Corinthians 15, says this. Now, I would remind you, I want to make sure you remember this. I want to make sure that you know this, brothers, of the gospel. 
There's that word gospel. Uh, we know it means good news. But let me tell you how it was used. Matter of fact, this was a word that was used by the Greeks before Jesus was even born. Uh, it meant good news. It was eugelion. But let me tell you how eugelion was being used. It was being used in this manner. When a new king, when a new emperor, when a new Caesar was coming on the throne, it would, go, it would be promoted. Good news, good news. We have a new ruler who's going to bring peace and prosperity, money to education, housing taxes will go down. I mean, all the, does it sound familiar? Good news. This is what's going to happen. You know, it was used in one other manner. When there was a great battle or great victory, uh, sometimes the messenger would come back home and, and he would shout, you get it on. It was good news. Probably the most famous example would be when the Persians attacked the Greeks at Marathon. And when they attacked the Greeks at Marathon, when the battle was over, the general sent a messenger back to Athens. And guess how far it was? A little bit over 26 miles. He ran all the way from Marathon. Thus, we have the Marathon now. And when he got to Athens, you know what he said? Eugelion! Eugelion! Victory! That's how it was used. Jesus takes this word. Paul takes this word and lets us know this is the best news possible. It's victory. There's a new king, a king that you've always desired, a leader, a ruler, to be the, the ruler of our hearts and the ruler of our lives. And he says, this is the gospel I preached to you that when you received it in which you stand, this is the hallmark, this is the crucible and by which you are being saved. He used the plural here, being saved, because why? Because when we trust Christ, when we transfer our trust from anything that we could do, we recognize that we are sinners, that we've been trying to run our own lives, that we've been trying to decide what's right and what's wrong. And we are a front to God because he created us. Here's our creator. But when we come to that place where we acknowledge that we are sinners, we need Christ. We want him to rule our lives and we transfer our trust to him. He becomes our ruler. Then the Bible lets us know at that point we are saved from the penalty of sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And secondly, the Holy Spirit begins to reside within us and he begins to empower us. And not that we don't sin, but we begin to grow as we begin to submit our lives more and more to the spirit of Christ. And we are being saved from the power of sin. And ultimately one day when Jesus returns or when we go to be with him, we will be saved from the presence of sin. So Paul says, as you are being saved, he continues and says this, if you hold fast to the word I preach, unless you believed in vain. And then here it is, verse three and four, the oldest recorded scripture we have in the New Testament. This has been uh, transmitted. This has been copied. This has been spoken multiple times. And Paul says, let me make sure you hear it. Let me make sure you know it. This is our creed as Christians. For I delivered to you as of first importance, of protos, of supremacy. This is what's most important, what I receive, that Christ, the who, Christ, Christ, the promised one, the one whom had been prophesied, the one who would come and give us new life, who would come and reign the promised Messiah, Jesus, the Christ. You know, there are many who think, well, Jesus was just a good teacher. Jesus was just a prophet. But the scriptures let us know, according to the scriptures, matter of fact, Paul literally says this, that we can know that Jesus is the Christ. He is the promised Messiah. And he has fulfilled the prophecies. We have over a hundred prophecies about Christ and he fulfilled them all. Let me just give you a few uh, that are very notable. That he would be born in Bethlehem check. And by the way, all these prophecies are six to 900 years before Jesus would be born. He would come to Jerusalem riding on a donkey, check. He would be betrayed by a friend. He would be sold for 30 pieces of silver and the silver would be thrown into the temple, check. Go back and read the gospels. You'll see that Judas did that. You'll see that each one of these are true and these are prophesied over 600 years before Christ would be born. He would be hated without cause, check. He would be sentenced with criminals, check. He would be beaten, check. 
He would willingly go to his death. Check. He would be surrounded and mocked. Check. His bones would not be broken. This is amazing because in Rome, with Roman crucifixion, what typically happened is men would suffer 12, 14, 16, 18 hours. And Roman soldiers were experts in crucifixion. They were experts in torture. <clears throat> and as they noticed they were getting pretty close to death or they were ready to go home after a 14-hour day, what they would do is they would break their legs and they would suffocate. This would certify that they, would, they were dead. But with Jesus, within just a few hours, he had died. And matter of fact, Pilate was even surprised. He said, go and make sure. So the Romans thrust a spear into his side, but they never broke his legs. They never broke his bones. This was prophesied. The Bible can, gives us continue opportunity to see that Jesus is the Christ. His hands and his feet would be pierced, checked. He would be mocked for God not saving him. Remember how the soldiers and how others said, he saved others, why can he not save himself? This is prophesied that he would be offered vinegar, that lots would be cast for his garments, and his grave would be with a rich man, with Joseph of Arimathea, who offers up his tomb for Jesus to be born. There are many others we could look at, but look at the detail. Look at the great links God has gone to show us that Jesus is the Christ. He is the promised one, and he can save us from our sins. And that's the why. Why? Because sin, because sin separates us from a holy God. We each have gone our own way. We each have decided to be the ruler of our own lives. We've each decided, I'll decide what's best and what's right and what's wrong. But that's an affront to a holy God. And our sin has separated us from him. So Jesus came to die. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, which is also a prophecy that was given to us in Isaiah 53. Colossians 1, Paul speaking here, says in verse 19, for in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, talking of Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. And you who once were alienated, we were alienated from God. We were hostile in the sense that we did not want anyone else to be in charge of our lives, doing evil deeds. He has now recon reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, through the death, burial, and resurrection in order to present you as holy and above reproach before God, not because you earned it, not because you deserved it, but because Christ has died and conquered the price of sin and death. But how does that happen? Well, it happens through the death, burial, and resurrection as we read our text. What does the Bible says? say? Paul in verse three, for I delivered you of first importance. I received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and he was buried. That's what the Bible teaches us. Why is that important? Well, David prophesied in the book of Psalms, chapter 16, verse 10, for you will not abandon to my soul Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You might say, well, how do we know that's about Jesus? Well, because in Peter's great sermon in Acts chapter 2, the sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 31, what does Peter say? He said, you know what? David foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not, and he quotes, not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Then Jesus raised up, and we are all witnesses the Bible tells us in that same chapter we're reading, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaking to the Corinthians church here. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But the good news is Jesus is and he has risen. That's the truth. And that's where we hold our faith. The who, the why, the how. I want to tell you a story of somebody 
who has experienced the death, burial, and resurrection, who has experienced the power of gospel. Chris, who we just baptized a while ago. You know what happened, Chris? Chris was born when he was a year old. Uh, he was taken by his mother and left uh, his father, and his father did not know where they were, and he went to live with his mother in another city, in another area. And when he was five years old, his mother got in trouble and went to prison. The authorities eventually found his father and sent him back to live in Los Angeles. But when he was living there, things were not good. It was bad. It was a tough situation. And by the time he was an older child, he was involved in gangs and substances. He spent most of his teenage years in juvenile detention center. And then he got out, but he found himself right back in the gang scene, right back in the substance scene. And he was just making mistake after mistake, getting in trouble. Uh, he eventually moved to Washington and found himself uh, in prison during that time. He had had a daughter who would later come back into his life and who's here today. And he, uh, he got in trouble again. He was in prison. And then when he was getting out, um, you know, he, he had a tattoo. He said, I got a tattoo put on my face because I had two strikes against me. And on the third strike, I was going to be in prison for life. I was thinking, there's no way I'm going to make it. I've gotten in trouble all my life. I can't seem to straighten myself out. I just seem to be trouble. It seems like no one can help me. There's no hope for me. And so he got this tattoo as a warning to just say, hey, I'm trouble. This is my life. You probably just ought to stay away from me. Just steer, steer clear from me. And during that time, he started to live with his mother, but he got kicked out. He found himself homeless, found himself in the woods. And there was a group, a gospel mission that came through there. And they invited him to come in and come get some food and get some clothing. And they gave him a place to stay. And they began to share the gospel with him. And he began to listen. He began to hear. But he still wasn't quite ready to fully commit his life to Christ. And uh, the wife uh, or the mother of his daughter called one day and said, why don't you come down to Texas? We live here now. You need to come and see your daughter. He said, I've not seen my daughter in a long, long time. And he said, okay, I'll come. So she paid for a ticket for him to fly down. He came down, got to see his daughter, got to reconnect with her. Uh, he began to go to an NA meeting and he said, you know, I was, I was ready. I was at that point to commit my life to Christ. And I started asking around uh, about a job, a way for me to, uh, to be able to support myself. And one of the guys in that group said, hey, I work at Lassiter Plumbing. He goes, would you see if you can get me a job? You think you could get me an interview? And he goes, well, I don't know if you can get one or not, but I'll ask. And a few weeks later, he got an interview. And when he came in, he said, uh, I came to Mr. Lassiter. I said, uh, Mr. Lassiter, uh, I'm really excited about the possibility of working for your company. And David Lasser, one of our leaders in our church on the right of here, he said, I just want you to know, this isn't my company, this is God's company. He goes, I knew at that moment I was in the right place. He said, um, Gary Brister, one of uh, David's leaders, began to disciple me. They gave me a place to live. I'm working there today. And today he was baptized as he professed his faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's the power of the gospel. What about you? You know, in the, as we conclude here, we see this. Jesus, uh, excuse me, Paul is reciting to the Corinthian church. He said, Jesus was buried. Then he was raised on the third day in accordance to scripture. You know, I'd never really studied that third day motif. And why is that important? Why did Paul use this? Why was this used in the early Christian creed? Why was that so important? important. Well, turns out it's all throughout the Bible. It's found uh, over a hundred times that third day, that, that number of wholeness that's used, that God's doing something divine. We see it in Genesis 1 when God created life in the third day, vegetation and trees. And then in the second third day, he creates man and wife. And then we see next, as a matter of fact, there are many other times in the Old Testament, we see in Exodus chapter 19, after God had delivered the children of Israel from the Egyptians, as they came to Mount Sinai, God told Moses, tell the children of Israel to cleanse themselves, to prepare themselves, for I am coming in my presence on the third day. And he brings the covenant. 
We see it in Esther chapter 5, where the nation of Israel, the people, the Jews, were going to be exterminated. There's an, ex, there's an edict that's gone out. But Esther, who is Jewish, goes before the king after she's prayed and fasted with her uncle for three days and asks for grace, asks for mercy, and she preserves. She saves the people of Israel on the third day. In the book of Hosea, chapter 6, the Bible tells us as God speaking to the uh, Jewish people, he's speaking to the nation of Israel. If they will pray, if they'll come back, he will revive them. Some translation uses the, use the word, I will resurrect you on the third day, that metaphor. You see it in Jonah chapter one, uh, where Jonah is for three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. And you might say, well, why is that important? Well, because Jesus uses, he makes the illusion himself in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of earth. Now, we see this 14 times in the gospel, this third day used about Jesus. Um, I'm just going to look at Matthew. We're just going to look at the four in Matthew. And what does Matthew 17 tell us? Verse 22, as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is about to be delivered in the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the what? Third day, Matthew 20, 19, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified and he will be raised on the third day. And then after Jesus died, his enemies, uh, the religious leaders went to Pilate and this is what they said. Sir, remember how this imposter said that while he was still alive after three days, I will rise. Do you think that's a coincidence? I think not. That's a whole lot of coincidences. I want you to listen to Dylan Chase, who's been at our church multiple times and who created this uh, music video just for us. Turn your attention to the screen, if you would, at this time. God, we confess our lack of utter amazement. God, forgive us for being so familiar with the love song you played us. This is not cinema. This is not like the story we've read before. This is a literal death to life love story, not a metaphor. Forgive me for trying to say what I haven't said before. As if the proclamation that on the third day he was raised is boring or needs a better score. No. This redemptive symphony crescendos into holistic restoration. Be patient. Everything can change by the third day. And I can't sound smart enough. I can't preach hard enough, I can't sing long enough to substitute for the abundant truth that Christ died for our sins according to scripture. I don't need a stanza or a pattern. My anthem can't be fathomed. On the third day he was raised, the God-man, the final Adam. What if on your darkest days you preached a sermon to yourself entitled on the third day he was raised? What if when crippling depression mocked you to your face, you let out the faintest whisper, on the third day, he was raised. What if when unbelief distorted your gaze, you wrote out in all capital letters, on the third day, he was raised. Maybe they could count us in with the 500 eyewitnesses. And when they saw our life fundamentally changed, they'd have nothing left to say. But on the third day, he was raised. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I was studying the resurrection and looking at the Old Testament. Do you know how many resurrections there were in the Old Testament? Three. There are three of them. First, there was the widow's son at Zarephath that Elijah, the prophet, raised the boy. Then Elisha raises the Shunammite woman's son. And then there was a man who fell on to Elisha's grave and was revived, was resuscitated, was resurrected, so to speak. You know how many resurrections there were in the Gospels before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? Three. First one, Jairus' daughter, Mark chapter 5. The widow's son from Nain, Luke chapter 7. And of course, in John 11, Lazarus. And Lazarus, when was he raised? On the third day. What about a God who so intricately 
weaves his message all throughout history, all throughout the scripture to let us know that he sees us, that he knows, that he's omnipotent, that he desires a relationship with us and he makes it possible through Jesus Christ, through the death, burial, and resurrection, the who, the why, and the how. You know, there are three segments of everyone's life. We're born, we die, and then we're resurrected. And we have to give an account, either with Jesus and the blood that he spilt, that he's covered our sin because there could be no forgiveness sin without the shedding of blood. And Jesus shed his blood on our behalf for all who would put their trust and faith in Christ. Or if not, it's destruction and damnation. Those are the two choices that we have. We will all enter into that third phase of life. Are you prepared? Today is the day of salvation. Do not neglect so great a salvation. Would you pray with me? Maybe you're here today and you've You believe Jesus is a good guy, a good teacher. You believe he exists. You even believe his promises are true. But have you ever come to that place where you've transferred your trust and you said, Jesus, I recognize I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I recognize that I have been on the throne of my life. I have pushed you aside. And so today I give you control. I ask for your forgiveness and I ask that you credit me with your righteousness and that you save me from my sin. And I commit my life fully to you this day as Christ and Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life. And I commit to you this day. Amen. Well, if you're online, there's someone there. You can click that link. If you have questions or you're ready to pray or any way we can assist you. If you're here today, directly in front of you, there's a card. If you're visiting with us or if you have questions, if there's a prayer request that you might have, then I invite you to take that out and fill that out. And now I'm about to do something I've never done uh, on a Sunday morning. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do something I've never done before. I'm going to ask everybody to take out their phone. Would everybody get their phone for just a moment? Just take your phone out if you would. If you're like me, I don't bring one in the service, but I think 99% of you do. So if you don't mind pulling out your phone, and I'm going to ask you to just do this one simple thing. Would you text Easter to 9781, 97891? Just text that. And when you text that, you're going to see a series of questions. And if one of those applies to you today, then check that. Take a moment. If you're visiting with us today, if you prayed that prayer with me today, if you're ready to be baptized, if you're ready to grow in your faith, whatever God is leading you to do, take a moment to do that. Don't miss this great Easter Resurrection Sunday, a time for new life, a time to recognize the fullness and the power of the gospel. If God has spoken to you today, I want to invite you to respond as he leads.